Hello and welcome to the lab. What I have for you today is a review of the Siglent SDS6204A 2 GHz oscilloscope. This is the current flagship of Siglent's oscilloscope line. Uh, it's been out for about two years now, I believe, and they sent this one to me as a development unit for a Geoscope client. Uh, as it turns out, I was able to get the driver written pretty quickly, and I have the demo for another week and a half or so. And I figured it would be worth doing a review since there didn't seem to be one out there yet. On the back side of the unit, we see a Kensington lock, a micro SD card port for data storage. There is an external trigger input and an auxiliary output, which as far as you can tell is really only useful for uh, trigger output. There is support for an external arbitrary waveform generator, but it's actually a USB attached dongle. It doesn't come out of the back of the instrument. Uh, so it is actually a hardware option. Then we have HDMI video output, Ethernet and USB device for controlling the scope, and then USB host for connecting to either the uh, arbitrary waveform generator or USB storage media, etc. And then obviously our power input. Uh, notably missing on this is uh, a 10 megahertz reference in and out, which I would really like to have seen them add. It would not add that much to the cost. I know Siglent knows how to do this because uh, their 5000 series scopes as well as a lot of their RF gear has it. So I'm not sure why that was omitted on an instrument of this class for the flagship of their line that really seems like a major omission. So now let's turn it on and see how quickly it boots up. Looking at the control panel, we can see a fairly large display. It looks quite roomy and uh, not nearly as cramped as I've seen from some entry-level scopes in the past. So pretty good sized control panel, nothing really out of the ordinary here. Uh, one thing I do want to point out, and Siglent does this on a lot of their scopes now, and I really like it, is the auto setup and default buttons are slightly recessed, so they're harder to press by accident. And considering how long it can take to get an experiment set up the way you want, making it a little harder to blow away the config by accident is a nice feature, so I like it. Then on the bottom, we've got our BNC probe inputs. So we have four channels that are 50 ohm or 1 meg capable, and if you look on the side here, you'll notice that there are contacts for an active probe interface. Siglet offers a three different active probes that I'm aware of at this time. There's one and two and a half gigahertz single ended high impedance probes, and then a two and a half gigahertz active differential probe. Uh, they do also have an adapter from their proprietary interface to LaCroix ProBus that allows you to use LaCroix probes with the scope. I'm not sure of the exact set of models that support it, but that is a capability they offer. Then we have the connection for the MSO probe, which they did not send me to try out, so I unfortunately cannot show it to you today and then more USB ports and our compensation. Uh, another feature on the front panel that I have not seen anybody else do, and again, I really like, is that the trigger input actually is color coded. So we can see right now the trigger LED here is in pink. So we know channel two is selected as trigger. And if we go to our trigger menu and select say channel three, now we have to turn channel three on first. It's a little annoying. So if we now select channel three as a trigger input, now we can see that the LED turns on in blue. So it's a nice handy way of knowing what trigger is selected. And hang on, little, little things like that I haven't seen from other scope vendors. So for our first experiment, we have a Leo Bodner BNC pulse generator connected to channel one. This is spec'd at a 40 picosecond rise time. I've characterized this particular unit and it's actually a little bit less than that. And so whatever rise time we measure out of this is gonna be essentially the performance of the instrument. The data sheet is quoting 230 picosecond nominal rise time. So let's see how close we can get. We're gonna zoom in a little bit more. We see still nice square rising edges at now we're down to one nanosecond per division. And we are now running at 10 giga samples per second. And uh, this is, you'll notice it says ESR there. This is apparently an equivalent sampling rate. It looks like they're doing some sort of interpolation, maybe in FPGA. Uh, the data sheet is a little scarce on details, but as far as I can tell, the hardware A to D converter is actually only running at five giga samples per second. And then the 10 is just upsampling either in software or FPGA. 
So if we turn our measurements on, you can see I've already loaded the configurations uh, for measuring rise time. And then we're at about 254 picoseconds, which is slightly slower than what the data sheet is uh, specced at, but not by too much. So that, that's, that's pretty close to what we expected to say. Um, one thing you'll notice if we look at the measurement menu here is that we have uh, specs, we have uh, measurements for rise time, fall time, 10 to 90 rise, 10 to 90 fall. I do not see 20 to 80%, which is a fairly common measurement that a lot of instruments have. So that would be nice to add. And again, I'm sure Siglent could add this in a future firmware. It wouldn't take them that long to write the code. So that will be nice for them to add. So for our next experiment, we have a pseudorandom bit sequence generated by a little test board that I made with a TI retimer chip. And this puts out a differential PRBS. We can adjust the data rate. So now we're looking at 1.25 gigabits per second. We can bump that up to 2.5 or 5 or 10.315. And now we're just seeing garbage. So let's go back to 1.25. We can also adjust the amplitude. We can change the pattern PRBS 9, PRBS 31. And we can add more emphasis. So if we want to see a little bit more emphasis, we can turn that up. Now we're at 3 dB. 6 dB and 12 dB of emphasis. All right, so now we'll go back to default, no emphasis. Uh, just here. Okay. Well, that was unexpected. Our, it looks like the scope does occasional recalibrations and will just stop displaying stuff during that time. I was not expecting that. All right, so let's zoom out a little bit more. Now we're at 500k points at 10 giga samples per second. And one of the nice features that Siglent has uh, put in the 6000 series is they've actually got some serial data characterization software options. This is a fully loaded demo, so we can try that out. We can just select iPattern, and you can see I've already set up all of the configurations for looking at an eye on one of our channels. If we select signal settings, we can see right now we're looking at channel two, which is uh, the uh, negative side of uh, our test waveform. And uh, one of the complaints that I have uh, with this feature is that it only appears to allow you to select a single channel as an input. So we can see it lets us choose channel two or three of our differential signal. There does not seem to be any way to actually plot the eye of a differential signal. And with a scope in the two gigahertz bandwidth class, a lot of the signals you'd want to be looking at are differential. So uh, not having the ability to plot an eye of a differential signal is really something that I would have expected for an instrument in this class. So again, hopefully that's something they can add on a future firmware. And we can see if we scroll through options here, there is an option for clock recovery at either a fixed rate or a PLL. There does not seem to be an option to use an external reference. So you can't use it with something like HDMI or something where you've got a reference clock and then a bit clock at a multiple of that. And then we've got our measurements are on already. We can see our eye width, height, zero and one level, eye crossing point, and it looks like this is a total jitter measurement. So we can now exit out of the eye pattern mode and go back to and go back to our normal time domain measurements here. And now let's look at the jitter feature. We can select jitter analysis. Again, it sits around and thinks for a little bit. And now we can see we're able to look at either the raw waveform or the eye pattern. We can configure our clock recovery. We can configure a little bit of decomposition options, and it lets us configure a bathtub curve. There doesn't seem to be any way to resize this window, which is a little bit annoying, but we can see the bathtub curve. Uh, it looks like this is only in the horizontal. I don't see any way to do a vertical bathtub if you wanted to look at a noise limited signal rather than a jitter limited signal.
And we can then turn on decomposition. Are there any other options for measurements under here? All right, so we can look at our time interval error here. We can look at our random jitter. Doesn't seem we can look at both of them at once. And then if we close that, we can also look at a spectrum of our jitter. Is there a way to adjust the So it looks like we have to use the multifunction knob in order to adjust span of the spectrum. Again, it would be nice to be able to just use the normal vertical and horizontal adjustment knobs for this. That would be a fairly simple improvement. Overall, this is a pretty good entry to the high-speed signal characterization uh, market. It is definitely far more affordably priced than a lot of the competing options from the bigger vendors like LaCroix and Keysight and so on. Um, that being said, although it is significantly less expensive, it is also a lot less featureful than you would get from the more featureful characterization packages. Uh, there's a lot of things that I would like to see in here that are not yet available. Uh, emphasis removal and insertion, channel emulation, de-embedding. Uh, again, as you start to get into the multi-gigahertz instrument class, these are kind of capabilities that I would expect them to have. And it's a, it's, it's, it's a good start. It's not where I would like it to be, but it is definitely a step in the right direction, and I look forward to Siglent offering more advanced characterization options in the future. Hopefully some of these can come in firmware updates and aren't going to need any new hardware. And then for our last experiment, what I have uh, is uh, a PCIe SSD connected to an ARM single board computer, and uh, we are going to try and do some more advanced signal analysis using Gelscope Client and see how this allows us to expand the capabilities of the SDS6000 beyond what's offered by the built-in software options. So here we have channel 3 and 2, which are differential positive and negative PRBS signal. We are at 2.5 gigabits per second at the moment, and let's see what we can do with this. So we're going to subtract them. And let's also upsample so that the eye looks a little bit prettier. And we can now delete some of the original input signals. We don't need any more. That red's a little bit intense, so let's pick a different color. All right. So 2.5 gigabits per second is our data rate, and we can then display the eye pattern. And looks about what we would expect for 2.5 gigabits per second on a 2 gigahertz scope. We can see there's a little bit of separation here where we are not quite reaching the full amplitude before the next unit interval starts. So, and the overall waveform shape looks pretty much sinusoidal, which is again kind of what we would expect considering that our first harmonic is 1.25 gigahertz, which goes through just fine. Our second harmonic is 2.5, so it's going to be just past uh, the 3 dB bandwidth, and our third harmonic is pretty much gone. And let's verify that we can actually get a good decode out of this. I don't have any concerns given the eyes wide open, but just to make sure that the scope is actually giving us useful data. To do a quick threshold and PRBS checker with that clock. And let's choose a brighter color so it's easier to see. Okay, so right now the PRBS checker is reporting a ton of errors because it is trying to check a PRBS 7 and our input is actually PRBS 9. So we're just going to change that to PRBS 9. And as soon as we have the correct polynomial, We've got a nice flat error report, so no errors anywhere in the decode, which is good. That's exactly what we want. So at this point, it's looking like 2.5 gigabits per second is a very reasonable data rate for decoding on this. Obviously, you're not going to want to be doing signal integrity work at this speed just for comparison. 
if we bump back to 1.25 and clear that out, this is what our same PRBS at half the rate looks like. So we can see now we've got a much more square looking eye. We've got a distinct rising portion, flat portion, falling portion. You can see there's a little bit of over there, so that's our second harmonic there. And just a little bit of rain, but it's not too bad. And uh, so at this point, we're within the range of where it would be reasonable to be doing signal integrity work out to around one, one and a half gigabits per second it is probably reasonable. And then for protocol decoding, we should be able to use the scope out to about two and a half gigabits per second. At that point, you've got four samples per unit interval or two actual A to D samples because it's upsampling. And so that is going to be about your reasonable limit for protocol decoding. But still, for an instrument in this price class, being able to decode two and a half gigabits per second is pretty decent. So let's look at something a little more interesting than a PRBS. Let's look at some actual waveform data with some actual content. So we're going to delete all of that now. You'll notice the uh, frame rate is increasing significantly because we're calling less channels from the instrument. Um, Siglent's Skippy interface has historically been one of their weak points, uh, especially when paired with just a client or other PC-based tools. Uh, the update rate is not the greatest, and I really hope that they can improve this in future firmware. I've been pushing them to do this for a while, and they say they're working on it. So I am excited to see what they can come up with because this is, again, honestly, the single biggest weak point. They're, they're right at the edge of being fast enough to be comfortable to use, but it's still a little bit jerky, especially when you have a lot of channels enabled. And right now we're at half a million points memory, which isn't even all that deep. And so using deep memory on a lot of channels with just a client and the SDS 6000 is a little bit painful, especially if you're used to working with higher end hardware. That being said, this is still the best performance that I've seen from a signal and scope to date. And so I am I am definitely pleased they're making progress and uh, I look forward to seeing what they have coming next. All right, so right now we're looking at two and a half gigabit per second PCIe Gen 2 coming in through one of my AKL PT5 passive probes through a fairly long cable. There is a bit of loss in this cable. So just to give the scope a fair shake, let's de-embed it. So we're going to say add, import, touchstone, and uh, that's going to be under the most recent production lot, and this is cable number four. And we're going to de-embed S21 from these S parameters. And next, we are probing PCIe transmit very close to the uh, SOC. And uh, as a result, we're gonna see a ton of overemphasis. If we just pause this for a second, you'll see on all the rising, we've got this huge overshoot, probably got at least three dB of emphasis on here. So let's go and take that away before we do anything else. We are at two and a half per second. Let's take off three dB of emphasis and see if we have a bit of a nicer looking eye now. gigs with emphasis removed and we can adjust our scale there and eye pattern of that is looking nice and open and let's just move this there so it's a little bit more square okay so that looks more than open enough to decode let's see what we can do with it a threshold leave that as default Decode 8B10B, and that's still looking good so far. We've got a bunch of control characters where we expect. We've got skip sequences and commas where we expect, so everything is looking good. Let's decode up the stack here. We got a single lane, so we'll leave that as default, and then decode our data length. We've got DLLPs coming through. That all looks good and expected. And let's go generate some traffic on the link. This is uh, whatever SSD I found cheapest on Amazon, so I have no idea what garbage is on it, but let's do some DD reads from it. And now we're generating some read traffic. We can then close that and uh, decode the 
transaction layer. And we are getting perfectly good looking decodes. I'm not seeing any errors or failures. So yeah, this is this scope is absolutely capable of decoding serial data at reasonable rates. Uh, two and a half gigabits per second is it's fast enough for some applications. It's uh, PCIe uh, Gen 1, uh, gigabit Ethernet. Uh, there's, there's quite a few things you can do uh, with decodes in this performance class. That being said, one thing that I really would like to see and again, I don't know if it's possible for them to squeeze this into the existing FPGA on this or if it would have to be a new product. But with the scope in this class, especially when we're starting to add signal integrity capabilities and eye patterns and so on in the hardware, it would really be nice to have a CERTES trigger. So at the moment, you can see that we are just spamming the PCIe link and pretty much saturating it with as much data as we can throw through it. And so it doesn't really matter when we trigger, we're going to see something interesting. But uh, in a real world situation where you're trying to decode data when some interesting event happens and being able to look at a mostly idle link and then trigger when a particular TLP comes in or something like that would be really handy to have. And uh, again, sometimes you may be able to kind of fake this if you've got a GPIO on an FPGA that whenever a certain command comes in, you could then go and trigger it or if you're debugging a PCI implementation, if you could have your chip set a GPIO right before you send a TLP or something like that, then you don't actually need a hardware AB10B trigger on the scope in order to be able to do it. But again, this, this is one of those things that, yes, it would be a fair bit of engineering work. It may or may not require hardware changes or even just a future generation of the product, but it would really greatly increase the usability for this kind of work. Uh, Overall, though, I really do like the 6000 series. It is definitely my favorite Siglent scope I've used to date, and uh, I look forward to seeing what Siglent has coming next. I hope you all enjoyed this review of the Siglent SDS 6204A. Uh, thanks for watching, and if you do decide to buy one of these scopes, definitely tell Siglent that you watched my review. If uh, you decide to use it with Geoscope Client, again, definitely tell them that as well. Uh, the more people are asking about Geoscope Client, uh, the more vendors are likely to be supporting the project and helping out. And uh, again, I don't get any financial compensation out of it, but good relationships with vendors is how we get better instrument drivers. It's how we get demo scopes like this one. And uh, it really helps out everyone in the community. So thanks for watching and I will see you next video.